Hi guys, um, so this video is in response to a question in the group uh, with regards to the Holy Spirit um, and, and it's a, I guess it's a, it's a video that I've been thinking about doing for a while um, <laughs> and, and, and I guess the difficulty with it is, um, I guess I've, I've got to explain these concepts and yet I have a question mark over how useful it is for me to explain these concepts. Um, and and Jesus had the same conundrum when he wrote the course. Um, and the way he got around it was that he wrote the course on two different levels. So he, Kenneth Wapnick calls it level one and level two. And level one is where he gives us absolute statements, um, incontrovertible. Um, uncompromising statements on the nature of God as a singularity. And then what he does is he writes the course on another level, which is, here's a helpful way to see it as long as you think you're in the dream. As long as you think you're a body and you think you're a separate mind, here's a helpful way of seeing things from within the illusion where everything is made up anyway. So here is an illusory way of looking at things, which is actually helpful. And rather than further sticking you into illusion, this will loosen your attachment to illusion. Now it's itself illusory, um, but it's an, an illusion which is right-minded and which can actually ultimately um, undo illusions. So that's how Jesus gets away with it in the course. Now. So this is really useful because egos, um, which don't really exist, but egos are terrified of level one. Um, and so level two is a more helpful way to begin. Um, so we could look at this as, you know, the ladder Jesus talks about in the Song of Prayer. And we're gradually going up rungs on the ladder. And as we do, we'll sort of like see things differently. So if you like, there's a level in the course whereby it's like an entry level. And this is Jesus giving us parables and fairy tales and useful ways of seeing things within the dream, which is helpful to um, begin separating us from identification with the dream. Now, so this is, this is really good. This is very clever of Jesus. Um, now, the difficulty with it is that because the course is written on two levels, um, it has caused um, a, a split in the way that the course can be understood. So, um, and this split is the reason why um, Kenneth Wapnick is so vilified by so many people within the course community, because although he taught level two, um, it was always in the larger context of level one. Um, so he honoured both levels uh, that Jesus writes the course on and, and egos are terrified and horrified by that because, um, you know, that, <laughs> that desire to be separate um, is so strong. Um, everyone wants the course to be about being a holy ego. Um, it, wants, it wants the course to be about there's a me. Um, you know, so Jesus tells us, you know, um, on level one, we say God is, and then we cease to speak because there's nothing else. There is God as a singularity. He says that um, there is nowhere that the father ends and the son begins as something separate from him. So in other words, he can't tell the difference. And he says that God is the first person of the Trinity and there's no second or third person of the Trinity. So this is in heaven, right? And again, what he's saying is God is a singularity. Um, a really important statement in the course um, that Jesus makes is that salvation is nothing more than the escape from concepts. Now think about that. He's saying there is nothing more to salvation than the dropping of all concepts. Concepts are what's um, blocking um, your knowledge of God, your, your oneness with God. It's the only thing that's standing in the way and salvation is simply dropping all the concepts in your mind. Okay. <laughs> um, 
now the problem is that the ego is the noise in your head which is trying to establish its happiness love and peace uh, with the noise and it's fighting against everything it sees as the reason why it's not loving and help and, and, and happy and at peace okay and what Jesus is saying is you know the voice is incapable of happiness um, all we got to do is silence the voice and you discover what you already are which is which is happiness itself um, so so this is our this is our level one there is no concepts you know um, <clears throat> Jesus talks about revelation uh, in the course which is um, the experience of God and, and I've heard people sort of like describe revelation you know similar to what Helen felt in the subway and stuff like that and that's not revelation uh, revelation would be um, an experience of the singularity of God there would be no you in revelation it would be an experience of God is um, so I don't know in terms of Helen's experiences I, I can't see any there that sort of qualifies as an experience of revelation I think there are experiences that qualify as an experience of the real world uh, but not revelation okay so I'm, I'm going to um, address this question um, that was asked in the course by Peter and I really appreciate how the question was um, well thought out and well structured and non-confrontational <laughs> I really appreciate that I think it was really well written and and I'm going to um, you know I, I've known since I wrote a post in the in the group um, <laughs> where I said I was doing forgiveness wrong and I imagined Jesus saying to me um, FFS keep as in for F sake um, stop fighting against what doesn't exist <clears throat> in order to do forgiveness properly and that raised a few eyebrows um, you know because to um, maybe to people new to the course that would seem blasphemy or like why would Jesus say that um, and so um, w we've got to understand that Jesus Jesus doesn't say anything um, and the Holy Spirit doesn't say anything and so we're gonna have to talk about um, we're going to have to talk about the Holy Spirit um, and Jesus um, in, in three ways. Um, there is the thoughts that we think with God. Then there is the memory of the thoughts that we think with God. And then there is the echo of the memory of the thoughts that we think with God. So I guess just bear in mind, I'm gonna to have to go through those three different dimensions to the thoughts we think with God um, in, in, in the answer here. Um, so let's address the question, because I think this provides a nice structure for me to talk about some, some concepts that um, sort of need talking about. So um, Peter or Adrian, I think it's a joint account, but um, one of the Bernardin, um, couple have asked a question and it is I have a question for you that may be thought-provoking to others too I have listened to a couple of your talks read a couple of your posts and have enjoyed them I'd like to point out what I perceive as a contradiction and perhaps have you clarify your message because I may be understand misunderstanding you in most of your talks posts you talk about the silence being the Holy Spirit I do uh, I talk about the Holy Spirit as being the part of your mind that um, doesn't entertain concepts. In many non-dualistic teachings, they talk about how you are the unchanging awareness behind all phenomenal experience, the silence from which all creation happens. This is true. Um, so this is the I am presence, not I am Keith. This is pure awareness. Because again, Jesus tells us that um, salvation is nothing more than the escape from concepts. Well, what's left in a mind with no concepts? Awareness. A non-judgmental presence. Um, I feel like you follow this theme in, in your teachings. And again, correct me if I'm misunderstanding you. In a sense, saying that what we are 
is this emptiness of awareness and not what appears to be happening in it. Correct. So again, salvation is nothing more than the escape from concepts. Well, that means what you are is that which holds no concepts. <laughs> so that is exactly what I'm saying. My impression from reading the Course, though, is that the silence is the means through which the Holy Spirit can reach your mind, rather than the Holy Spirit being the silence itself. Now, so here's what we have to talk about levels. Um, well, let's continue with the question for a moment. The Course also talks about real thoughts. I don't recall the exact passages, but I believe the general message was that by going beyond what we refer to commonly as our thoughts, which are image making in truth, and coming into the silence, we open to our real thoughts. My understanding is our real thoughts are not image making, but nor are they empty like awareness. In that the truth of who you are isn't so much this void of awareness itself, but rather something created though not in matter, obviously. Mm -hmm. So here's where the apparent contradiction lies. Now, what we need to understand is this. Jesus tells us um, nothing real can be threatened and nothing unreal exists. Now, what he's saying to us there is what God creates is eternal, unchanging, absolute, and unassailable. There is nothing changing about what God creates. What he creates is true, forever. <laughs> um, it cannot be untrue um, and it cannot be changed. Okay, so that's that's a really crucial understanding of the difference between um, creation and what we make. Creation is eternal, unchanging, absolute and unassailable. It cannot be attacked, it cannot be changed. If it's true, it's true for eternity. So the thoughts that you think with God aren't thoughts in the sense of the way we think about thought. Because for us, thoughts are these fleeting things that come in. One minute there's no thought, then this thought comes in, and then the thought subsides and another thought changes it. Um, so, so clearly we, we, we need to understand that that process of thought um, has nothing to do with God. It is changing. It is impermanent. Um, it is fleeting. And those are things that cannot be true of what God creates. So, the only thoughts, uh, the thoughts that we think with God are always the same. They don't change. They don't come and go. Um, they, they don't, you know, alter based on your mood. Um, the thoughts we think with God are always there and will never not be there. So that's what we need to understand about the thoughts that we think with God. Now, those thoughts are outside of consciousness. Those are the thoughts in heaven, right? And, and again, in heaven, there isn't, there isn't a me um, to perceive the thoughts of God. Um, perception is part of the dream, remember. Heaven is knowledge, where there is no knower and that which is known. There is no knower and, you know, um, something other than the knower. <laughs> It was just knowledge itself. Um, so again, the experience of God would be a singularity and that there are qualities of that singularity that are eternal, unchanging, absolute and unassailable. And they will be qualities of oneness, permanence, um, unchanging, um, love, peace. Um, these will be the thoughts that we think with God. But again, they're not thoughts in the sense that we would have thoughts as an ego. Um, these, the, this is the continuity of reality. Okay, so that's, that's what we need to understand about the thoughts we think with God. Um, now, whilst we're stuck within consciousness as perceivers, um, this is all illusory. Um, but what, what we can access is we can access the memory of the thoughts we think with God. And again, these would not be fleeting and changing thoughts. These would be constant. And so when we join with the Holy Spirit, um, 
as, as a pure awareness. In other words, we drop all of our concepts. We use Jesus' formulas. Um, I don't know what anything is for, so I drop all my concepts. Um, I say, I don't know how to look at this. Uh, please show me how to look at this. You know, now again, you know, it's not, it's not the prayer being answered uh, that sorts that out. It's us going into a state of receptivity uh, beyond our own concepts for something else to replace it. That's where the, that's where the magic happens. So we join with the Holy Spirit as a pure awareness without concepts. Now again, Jesus tells us of that holy instant, you know, we don't have to be completely without thoughts um, that are not pure, but we have to have no desire to hold on to them. So again, it's the rejection of all my own concepts um, to allow a pure awareness to arise. Now, the absence of concepts, the absence of a noise in my head, this being of pure awareness, um, this emptiness, um, isn't empty. Within it is the memory, the reflection of the thoughts I think with God. And so awareness, aware of itself and its wholeness and holiness um, contains the memory of the thoughts I think with God, which is a love that is abstract, not specific. Within awareness um, is love's presence, and it's not a specific love. It's not a love for me. There is no lover and beloved. There is love itself. Now again, it's the memory of love itself. Um, because we're inside consciousness. And so within consciousness, all we have is the memory of God. And that's what the Holy Spirit is, the memory of God's oneness, the memory of God's singularity. And, and the qualities of that singularity. And so within awareness, um, a love reveals itself, which is non-specific. It's not a love for me. Um, there's no lover and beloved. It is love itself. And within awareness, there is joy, pure, causeless joy. And there is peace, a peace that transcends all understanding or ability to put it into words. That's what's there within awareness. Now again, these are not the thoughts we think with God. It is the memory of the thoughts we think with God, which is the best we can do as long as consciousness uh, appears to it to, to, to be our reality until consciousness is undone. So now we've talked about the thoughts you think with God, which is the qualities of God within the singularity. And then we have the Holy Spirit, which is the memory of the thoughts, the, the memory of God's singularity, the memory of memory of oneness, and within that, the, the thoughts that we would think with God, which again are not changing thoughts. The love within awareness um, is always there. The peace is always there. Um, the oneness is always there. Okay, so, so the, the, um, the thoughts that we think with the Holy Spirit would be that, the abstract love, not specific, the causeless joy, not caused, the peace, um, which cannot be put into words. That is the thoughts that we think with the Holy Spirit. Now, <laughs> um, and I know I'm going to contradict the way other people teach this because they talk about, you know, the guidance from the Holy Spirit being the thoughts that you think with God. And I'm going to go, no. Again, the thoughts you think with God are unchanging. They are true always. Um, and the memory of that, again, those thoughts would be unchanging. And then what we have is the echo of the Holy Spirit's voice. So the Holy Spirit's voice is only those thoughts that we, the memory of those thoughts we think with God, which is oneness, 
peace, love, stillness. Now, so, we have to talk about Jesus' two levels in the Course again. On level one, he says, the Holy Spirit is the, the memory of God's oneness. That's what the Holy Spirit is. And this is a place of truth within your mind. Uh, Ken always like, likened it to a lighthouse. And you bring illusions to that truth and the illusions are given a right-minded interpretation. Um, and that would be the, the bringing of the darkness to the light. Now, on level two, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit. He, well, he anthropomorphizes the Holy Spirit. He, he talks about the Holy Spirit like it's a person. Um, again, on level one, he says that, you know, um, God does not take steps uh, because there's nothing to do about uh, a separation that has never happened. He says God doesn't know about individual identity because it's not actually true. At no point in time does the ego actually exist at all. At no point in time does this world actually exist at all. At no point in time does anything that you perceive exist. At no point in time does the person that you think you are exist. Only God is real. Only the singularity of God is real. Everything else is an illusion. Um, now, but within level two, Jesus kind of tells us a fairy tale. You know, the ego has terrified us um, of, of, of going in our mind where, where there's the memory of um, love and peace and truth is. The ego has terrified us of, of, of trusting that place in our mind. It says, no, if you go near that, you'll be destroyed. Um, you'll disappear. Um, and so Jesus tells us a helpful fairy tale, which says, no, you know, God did not put that, you know, Holy Spirit in your mind to bring you back to heaven to be just punished by God, which is what the ego told us. Jesus is saying, look, look at it this way. God put the Holy Spirit in your mind and, um, and, and it's there to, to help you, to teach you, to guide you. Um, and to, to bring you to your senses and bring you home to God. Now again, on level one, that's not true, because um, God doesn't do anything because there's nothing to be done. Um, but that's a helpful way of seeing it from within the dream, because it's undoing our fear of the memory of God in our mind. And, and it's a helpful way of seeing things. Um, so, again, the Holy Spirit as the memory of God's oneness and the thoughts what we think with God isn't actually a person. It's the part of your mind that knows the separation isn't real. It's the memory of God's oneness we've brought into the dream with us, brought into our delusion with us. Um, it's not God. It's the memory of God. Um, it's, it's, it's a part of your mind uh, which, which knows that separation is an illusion. And as such, it's not a person. Yes, Jesus anthropomorphizes the Holy Spirit. Yes, he anthropomorphizes the ego. Um, but he does actually apologize that for that in the Course and says he needs to do that for pedagogical re reasons. Um, so, so the Holy Spirit doesn't actually say anything, and the Holy Spirit doesn't actually do anything. However, if we think about the Holy Spirit as your memory of I am, before it became the, the part that doesn't buy the delusion of I am Keith. 
if we think about it as pure awareness without the concepts. And if we call that, um, for now, um, your true self, the Holy Spirit is your right mind. Um, so it is your true self. Um, and then you have your wrong mind, which is Keith, and all the concepts that are going on in my mind. Now again, <laughs> Jesus says to us in the Course, you know, who is the you um, who is living in the world? And what he's saying is, there's no you living in the world. At no point in time does the ego actually exist at all. At no point in time is the world real. At no point in time is there a you uh, perceiving itself separate from God. Um, and again, he says, the self that you have made does not exist at all. It's not bad or good. It is unreal nothing more than that. Um, it in no way changes what you actually already are, have always been and always will be. It is simply a delusion and it's not real, it doesn't exist. It is a shadow. Um, so, <sighs> there is only you as God created you and the memory of that is I am, it is pure awareness. And then there is something that's completely unreal, which is everything else. Um, and so, whilst we are in this illusory place, or identity, as an ego, which does not exist at all, it's simply unreal, as Jesus says, um, your true self, which let's call it I am, or pure awareness, the absence of concepts, um, if, if you like, that has become compressed into this illusory individual identity, this separateness. Um, and this is on a natural state. And, you know, if you imagine it like a, like a squeezy ball, and so I am, um, or pure awareness or the absence of concepts, um, becomes apparently becomes uh, compressed into an I am this, I am that um, separateness, then that's an unnatural state. And so if you like, there is a, if I open that squeezy ball, it will immediately return back to its, its proper shape. So it's a bit like it's in the unnatural state and the memory of its true state is operating like a force on the unnatural state to bring it back to, to wholeness, to bring it back to how it should be, to bring it back to how it is. So we can think about, again, the only thing that's true is I am. The only thing that's true is pure awareness without concepts. And the I am this and I am that is completely untrue. It doesn't have any reality whatsoever. Yes, we think it does, but that doesn't make it true. Um, so we could think about the Holy Spirit as the force that our true self is exerting on this unnatural, deluded um, situation that we're in, in order to return it back to its wholeness. So we could think about the Holy Spirit that's why Jesus says the Holy Spirit is a correction. Um, and once the ego, the compressed state, um, is, is, is undone, that the Holy Spirit um, disappears also. Now, and what that means is the Holy Spirit disappears as a corrective force. That what you really are um, was exerting on the unnatural state. So again, what you are as I am is your memory of God's singularity that we've brought into the dream with us. And within the dream, that true self exerts a force drawing the unnatural state back towards what's natural. And we could call that force the Holy Spirit. 
So we could say the Holy Spirit disappears as a correction for what doesn't exist. Um, but the, the true self, which we could call Christ's consciousness, it's a little bit like the Holy Spirit, is the, the force of Christ's consciousness um, drawing the unnatural state back to what's natural. And that will be the corrective action of the Holy Spirit. Now, so, so within the illusion, the delusion, um, there is the memory of oneness and its action of drawing, drawing us back towards our natural state. And and that force is something that we can connect with by letting go of our concepts. You know, I don't know what anything is for. Um, show me a different way to look at this. Let me forget about all my ways of looking at it. Show me something different, dropping all concepts. It's always about the dropping of the concepts. And then we connect with this, this I am, this pure awareness. And again, that awareness isn't, that emptiness of concepts isn't empty of the memory of the thoughts I think we've got. The thoughts I think we've got are underneath the noise of concepts. So the ego says if there's no concepts, you'll cease to exist. Uh, but that's, that's the lie. <laughs> um, underneath the concepts, are the thoughts that are eternal. There is the causeless joy. Um, there is the non-specific love, the abstract love. There is the peace that surpasses all understanding. That's there within a frame of mind where there are no concepts. So when we talk about the guidance of the Holy Spirit, This is what you should do in the world. This is how to undo your guilt. This is how to be truly helpful. These are not the thoughts we think with God, and these are not the memory of the thoughts we think with God, because they're changing. So this is not the voice of the Holy Spirit, this is the echo of the voice of the Holy Spirit. So in the Song of Prayer, Jesus says, you know, this information, this guidance, is not the voice of the Holy Spirit, it is the echo of the reply of his voice. It is the way in which your mind, what you do is you touch that place of truth in your mind, which has no concepts. And where the, the thoughts you think, the memory of the thoughts you think with God are present. And as you do that, your mind will translate that experience into guidance. It may hear it as a voice, but again, the voice of the Holy Spirit is stillness. However, your mind may translate that into a voice. It may translate that into a vision. Uh, it may translate that into intuition. And this is the way that the concepts in your mind, which are keeping you unconscious, uh, which, is, which are keeping you uh, joined with the ego and not the Holy Spirit, um, it's the way that they're being given a right-minded interpretation. Now again, it's illusory. The thought system of the Holy Spirit is still an illusion because all concepts are wrong. <laughs> Salvation is the nothing more than the escape from concepts, all of them the ego's concepts and the Holy Spirit's concepts, but the Holy Spirit's concepts are concepts that will undo concepts. <laughs> they are a set of illusory concepts designed to bring you to a point of readiness to let go of all concepts. 
They are themselves illusory, but they are the means of undoing illusion. So again, the guidance that you get with the Holy Spirit, what I should do if I hear a voice, um, that is not a voice of the Holy Spirit. That is not that place of truth in your mind where there are no concepts. It is the echo. It is a side effect. It is the way in which the concepts in your mind are, are given a right-minded interpretation by touching that place of truth in your mind. It's the way that truth bleeds into the concepts in your mind and gives them a right-minded perception which will undo our stuckness within illusions. So again, A Course in Miracles is not the voice of Jesus or the Holy Spirit. It is the echo of Helen touching that place of truth in her mind. It is the thoughts in Helen's mind about psychology, because she was a psychologist, about teaching and learning, because she was an educator, about Shakespeare, because she loved Shakespeare, and about the King James Bible, which she knew inside out and backwards and sort of hated and argued with. All of that was, all of that's what was what was what was what was in her mind, and she touched that place of no concepts in her mind, that place of truth, that place which contains the memory of the thoughts that you think with God, and that truth bled into all those concepts in her mind and gave them a right-minded interpretation, and that's what a course in miracles is. Again, it is not the voice of Jesus or the Holy Spirit. This is the echo of the voice as Jesus tells us in the Song of Prayer. And it's stunning. <laughs> I, the, the, the way Helen was able to get herself out of the way um, and to have all those concepts in her mind um, given this right-minded interpretation is, is stunning. And, and, and unparalleled and, and I can think of no other example of of such a such a such a channeling such oh my god it's 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 yeah and, and the more you read the course the more your appreciation grows for for how well Helen got herself out of the way and had this um, you know place of truth completely give a right-minded interpretation to everything that was in her in her thoughts you know so we talk about Jesus writing the course <laughs> um, but again it, if we if we look at the course from a level one um, there is no Jesus Jesus didn't dictate the course <laughs> Jesus is a dream figure, the same way Helen is a dream figure, Keith is a dream figure, and you watching this video are a dream figure. And again, as Jesus tells us in the Course, the self that you made is not the Son of God. Therefore, it, this self does not exist at all. And anything it seems to do and think means nothing. It is neither good nor bad. It is unreal, and nothing more than that. It does not battle with the Son of God. It does not hurt him, nor attack his peace. It has not changed creation, nor reduced eternal sinlessness to sin and love to hate. So the self I think I am, the self that I've made, forgotten I've made, and now I'm deluded about, it doesn't actually exist. Only God is real, God's singularity. Helen never existed. Uh, Jesus never existed <laughs> you know these are movie characters um and so you know so when we talk about the course we say jesus says this and jesus says that but it's not jesus she, helen touched that place of truth she touched pure awareness outside of concepts um and and as helen touched that place of truth in her mind um helen's mind translated that in a way that she could relate to that place of truth without fear. And for Helen, that was to understand it as being Jesus. It could just as easily have been Helen, you know, translating it as Buddha, um, or as Krishna, or as Archangel Michael. 
Um, it, it could have been any of those things. So again, you know, at level one, it's not true to say that Jesus wrote, wrote the Course or that he dictated the Course. There never was a Jesus. The false self, at no point in time does it actually exist at all. It is just this place of truth. It is this place in our mind that concepts have not intruded on. This I am presence, this pure awareness, this absence of consciousness, that is the lighthouse that's there. It is the memory of God's oneness and the thoughts that we think with him which are constant. And, and any concepts that are brought to that place in our mind, um, that, that truth will bleed into those concepts and give them a right-minded interpretation to bring us home. So let's return to the question. It's just so I stay on point. So my impression from reading the Course, though, is that the silence is the means through which the Holy Spirit can reach your mind, rather than the Holy Spirit being the silence itself. So let me just say that, you know, the stillness and the silence, the absence of, of, of concepts, wouldn't come to me for a moment there, the absence of concepts um, is your true self. And then this place of truth. And then we could call the action part of that, the, the corrective um, effect that that has on the concepts in your mind, we could call that the Holy Spirit. So I guess what I'm saying is, there is the I am part of your mind. There is this pure awareness. There is this absence of um, absence of the word that we just <laughs> won't stay in my mind. Um, the absence of so salvation is nothing more than the escape from concepts. <laughs> um, and the concept of concepts won't stay in my mind. That has to be a good sign. Um, we, we could talk about um, the, the action of your right mind, that true self, that part of you that's not within the world. And we could talk about the way in which it has a corrective um, purpose uh, and function. We could call that aspect of it the Holy Spirit um, and, and, and the way in which that, that, that can intuitively bring us towards situation which will undo our sense of our belief in separateness and guilt. Um, and again, this is the force that our true self is exerting on our false self that wants to draw it back towards what's natural out of what's unnatural. So we could call that the Holy Spirit. So we could say it's the action of the right mind. So again, you see, in terms of the question, my impression from reading the Course, though, is that the silence is the means through which the Holy Spirit can reach your mind, rather than the Holy Spirit being the silence itself. See, again, this, this is anthropomorphizing the Holy Spirit. It's making the Holy Spirit into a person, into an individual, you know, into a God or like an angel. But the Holy Spirit on level one is simply your memory of oneness and the memory of the thoughts you think with God. It is that place of truth we bring illusion to, where illusion is undone by getting a right-minded interpretation, a, 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 a way of perceiving uh, which is helpful to undoing perception altogether, to bringing us to that point of readiness to let go of all concepts. So again, the Course talks about real thoughts. I don't recall actual passages. But I believe the general message was that by going beyond what we refer to commonly as our thoughts, so this is the insane voice in our head, um, and coming into silence, the part of our mind which doesn't entertain concepts, we open to our real thoughts. Yes, you do, but those real thoughts are only the causeless joy, the um, abstract love, and the peace that surpasses all understanding. So my understanding is that our real thoughts are not image-making, but nor are they empty like awareness. Now again, awareness is not empty. <laughs> Within awareness is your memory of the thoughts you think with God. 
So again, awareness is empty of concepts. And once the concepts are gone, there is the thoughts, which are the memory of, of what you think we've got. But, 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 but those, those memory of the thoughts you think we've got, they're not thoughts, they're not concepts. It is, it, it is a, a reality that's there within awareness. But those thoughts are not based on concepts, it's based on what's, what's true or the memory of what's true. The truth of who you are isn't so much this void of awareness, it is, but rather something created, though not obviously in matter. So again, uh, we were created as I am. I mean, you know, ultimately God is only... <sighs> See, again, within heaven there's only the singularity of God. Jesus talks about a process of creation where God extends himself. And his extensions Jesus calls Christ. But again, Christ is simply the extension of God. It's just more God. Um, you know, again, on level one, Jesus is saying there's no difference between God and Christ. It's, it's just one. It's a singularity. There is no perceiver. There is no knower and that which is known. Um, so to bring that into context with the question. Um, so the, the, the memory of that singularity is just the, um, the Holy Spirit, which is the memory of oneness um, and the thoughts that we think there. So this, this pure awareness is, is not God is, because it's still happening within consciousness, but me as a pure awareness with no concepts is the, is the reflection of God is. Now it's not God is, because there's still me as a perceiver. Uh, that will be undone at the very last rung of the ladder. But, but pure awareness is a oneness that reflects God's oneness, that reflects God is. It's still illusory in the sense that it's happening within consciousness and that will be undone at the very, very last step and then there's just God, the singularity of God. But awareness is the the reflection of God is within the dream where there is no concepts and once concepts end the thoughts that are the memory of the thoughts that are eternal are there which is a causeless joy an abstract love and a peace that surpasses all understanding but those things aren't concepts they are there underneath concepts Another thing about the awareness thing is the creative aspect. The Course says God created you to create. And again, God extended himself, and those extensions of himself extend God. That's what's happening in heaven. Um, you see, we... Jesus doesn't talk about creation in heaven so we can understand what's ha happening in heaven. Like, you know, when we think about creation, we think first there was God and then he created his son. But that is you understanding creation within time and space. But time and space is the illusion. Time and space doesn't exist. So for us to think about a situation where there was a God and no Christ and then suddenly there was a Christ, that makes no sense. Um, within God where there's no time and space. So you see, we can't think outside of time and space. As Jesus says, you can't even think of God as not a person or a body. Um, and that's why he anthropomorphizes God and anthropomorphizes the Holy Spirit. Um, because, you know, again, as he says, you know, the mind that has taught itself to think specifically can no longer grasp the abstraction of oneness. 
Again, the mind trapped within time and space has no ability to grasp what it's like outside of time and space. So Jesus talks about creation in heaven um, in order that we can reflect it within the dream, but he doesn't expect us to understand creation in heaven because there's no understanding it. Um, because again, it's a creation where only God is extending himself. And again, it has no sense of like, you know, creation has, is not, there's nothing getting added. There's nothing getting bigger because that will be time and space. Um, there's nothing getting more that will be time and space. There's nothing getting added that will be time and space. There's no other getting created. Because again, knowledge is a, is a state where there is no knower and that which is known. So there's no other in heaven. There's no two-ness and oneness. There is just a singularity. There is oneness. So you see, it's really important that we don't try to convince ourselves that we understand what creation means, because we don't. Because again, it, it, it's, it's happening outside of time and space. Um, but the way... So you see, you know, God and God's love, uh, love just has to extend itself, which is creation in heaven. Love has to extend. It cannot not extend, which is the creative process in heaven. Now again, we can't understand that um, in heaven, but we can reflect it here by tapping into the memory of the thoughts we think with God, which is that love and joy and peace and as we do that it will naturally extend itself to all of our illusory brothers and that reflects God's creation within the dream so we're not asked to understand creation and we're not asked to create within the dream we're asked to reflect creation in the dream and we do that by touching that place of truth inside of ourselves, uh, which contains the memory of the thoughts we think with God, which cannot but extend themselves to everyone else within the dream. That's how we replicate um, creation, albeit that we have no ability to grasp what creation means outside of time and space and duality. Would you say that awareness is creative? My impression, it only observes. So the course, um, I mean, it's really complete as a spiritual spirituality because on the one hand, it, it um, it teaches really well the, um, the, the Vedanta teachings, which were all about the inward facing path, coming out of the world, coming out of the idea of a me um, and, and, and accessing the, the self within, the capital S self, uh, the place with no concepts, um, the place that's not in the world, uh, the place that doesn't buy the illusion of separateness from God. So the, the Course like the Vedantic tradition is all about that inward very facing path but then the course doesn't stop there it also teaches um, what's you know more profoundly taught it's implied in the Vedantic teachings but it's much more uh, profoundly sort of taught and explicit as opposed to implicit in the um, within the Tantric tradition spiritually speaking and this is the idea that you go in and touch that place of truth. And then as you do that, so you've turned your back on the world. You've turned your back on concepts. You've turned your back on the, the small s self. And you touch this place of truth inside of yourself. And then what you do is you turn back to all the objects of perception, which is the illusion. And then, and then you bless that um, with this place of truth. So, so this would be the idea of, you know, guidance from the Holy Spirit on what to do in your life. And, and again, it's not that the Holy Spirit needs you to do anything. The world was over long ago. Um, 
and 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 nothing you do in the world is for the benefit of anyone else because there is nobody else there's only one of us here anything you do in the world um we're only ever accepting the atonement for ourselves. And so, um, but, but again, once you touch that place of truth inside of yourself um, and, and you connect with the memory of the thoughts you think with God, that love, that peace, um, that joy, once you do that, it cannot but extend itself. And so it's going to extend itself into the dream. Not because the dream needs it, because there is no dream. Um, not because you're meant to do anything in the world. The whole thing is that when you touch that place of truth in yourself, it can only extend itself. And it cannot but extend itself, and it will do that within the dream. So, you know, that, again, that's the, the parallel. Uh, that's the way in which creation reflects itself within the dream. So let me just go back to the question and see is there anything else? Because um, the Facebook page I had open on my phone has refreshed. So let me go back to the question just to see if there's anything else I need to tie down on it. So I suppose my question is, when you talk about being awareness, are you saying that, that that what you are in truth is this void of emptiness in which the movie of time and space takes place? Yes. But again, it's empty of concepts. It's not empty of the thoughts, that you, the memory of the thoughts you think with God. Or do you also see the Son of God as a creative heavenly being? No, that would be a two-ness and oneness. That would mean that God is the first person of the Trinity and there is a second person of the Trinity. That would mean that there is a place where the Father ends and the Son begins as something separate from him. And if so, where does awareness fall into place in the context of being a creative heavenly being? So again, um, there's only one heavenly being. There's only a singularity of God. That is the absolute truth. You know, um, the point of dreaming didn't happen when the world was made by the ego. Um, the point of dreaming happened when a part of God's singularity suddenly perceived itself in relation to God. So the truth that God is the first person of the Trinity and there's no second or third, um, that ceased to be known when a part of God said, oh, here I am as something other than God. Here I am as something outside the singularity. So that's the point at which consciousness happened. Um, and that's what will be undone on the very last rung of the ladder. So the undoing of consciousness is the undoing of the idea that Christ can know himself in relation to God. So, you know, Jesus is trying to explain non-duality to us with dualistic words that are symbols of symbols and twice removed from reality. He's trying to um, explain non-duality to dualistic minds, to split minds. He's trying to explain one-mindedness to a split mind. Um, and and, and his, his compromise is to use words like, you know, God and Christ and um, and, and really, it's only necessary to use these words because there is the false idea that Christ can know himself in relation to God rather than God being the Alpha and the Omega, the everything. And anything existing outside of that is an illusion. It's not actually existing at all. Okay, I think that was <laughs> a really good question um, by... 
either Peter or Adrian. I hope the answer makes sense. These are complex, thorny issues. And, and again, the, <laughs> I didn't expect the video to last an hour, but I see that it has. Um, and, and again, these are issues that have divided the course community. Like I said, you know, this, this level one, which, you know, again, Kevin, uh, Ken, Kenneth Wapnick always taught um, and never compromised on is the reason why so many people just vilify Ken. He's the devil. Um, because, because egos don't want to really embrace non-duality. <laughs> egos don't want to embrace God is. Um, they want to say, no, God is, but I have a part in God is. Um, and that's not true um, in knowledge, because again, there's no knower and that which is known. There is nothing to know itself in relation to anything else. Um, but, but again, that's at the very end of the process. Um, and again, we can't just jump to a place of, of knowledge. Uh, we, we have to go through an illusory process, an illusory spiritual journey. Um, and again, once we've made the journey, <laughs> The journey never happened because you know at no point in time does the ego actually exist at all there's just the right mind and the wrong mind and the wrong mind has never existed um so but for us that believe we have a body and that there's a world there is an illusory process we have to go through and we're not expected uh, to understand oneness of god and we're not expected to understand um creation as it is in heaven and and we're not expected to say um there is no world and i have no brothers <laughs> we're not expected to do that that that's an unworthy form of denial it's denying what i've already made true for myself instead what i got to do is i've, I've got to bring my illusions to that that lighthouse in my mind that place of truth so those illusions can be undone gently i guess i should finish the video um just with another quote from the course um so bear with me here whilst I dig this out. Okay. Okay. Fear not that you will be abruptly lifted up and hurled into reality. In other words, you know, egos are terrified of level one within the course. That's why Jesus wrote a level two, which is nice fairy tales to go along with, that will actually awaken you gradually and gently from the dream. So, you know, and, and so he's he's done that, and it's perfectly fine to pursue the course like that um, until you reach a certain rung on the ladder. But he's saying, you know, don't be worried that you have to, like, undo yourself or delete yourself, you know? Your only job is to get to the real world. Um, where you're not identified with an insane voice in your head, where you are a pure awareness. Where you are this place where there's no concepts. And where the, the, the memory of the thoughts you think with God simply extend themselves into the dream all around you. And then you kind of, you, you perceive what you have extended into the world, which is love and peace and oneness, and that's all you experience within the world. So that's what the real world is. But again, that, that that's not a deletion of yourself. It just means that, you know, you've gotten rid of all anxiety, all pain, all upset, all lonely, all the, all the bad stuff is gone, and there is just what you are with none of those um, illusory concepts in your mind. Again, if you stop thinking for, for like two minutes, you don't cease to exist, but it will be a peaceful state. Um, so we've only got to, got, got to get to the real world like that. And once we've done that, uh, fear has been diminished sufficiently for consciousness itself to be undone. And then we return to the singularity of God. Melt back into the heart of God. But again, don't be worried that's going to happen straight away. That's not going to happen anytime soon. It's not even going to happen in, you know, when you've attained the real world, when you're like egoless within the split mind. Um, so again, time is kind. And if you use it on behalf of reality, it will keep gentle pace with you in your transition. So this, this is a transition. It's an illusory transition because what you're transitioning from has never existed. Um, but, but again, that will be our experience within the dream. 
the urgency is only in dislodging your mind from its fixed position here. What's a fixed position? A concept. So again, all we're ever asked to do in a situation is say, I don't know what anything is for. Drops all the concepts. And that puts you in, t in touch with that place in your mind um, where there's no concepts. There is just the thoughts that you, the memory of the thoughts that you think with God. And they will then bleed into all the thoughts that you're holding in your mind, all the concepts that are there, and start to give them a right-minded interpretation. Um, more and more bringing you to a point of readiness to let all concepts go. Okay, so if you stuck with me all the way through the hour, um, thank you very much. And I, I hope the video was helpful. And uh, within the group, A Course in Miracles with Keith, I'm sure we'll have lots of discussion on it. Have a great day, guys.